I want you now with every ounce of anointing that you have to put your hands on your head as if you're laying hands on your head. And I want you to repeat after me. Say, I command in the name of Jesus for spiritual understanding to be my portion. I open my mind to the word of God. I call my flesh under subjection. I will not miss out on anything that God has for me. I command my ears to hear the word of the Lord. I command my spirit to catch the word of the Lord. Father, transform me by the power of your word. In Jesus' name, when everybody says, amen, you may be seated. Tonight's teaching is going to position you on how to properly receive from God. It's going to position you on how to properly receive from God. From my note takers, which is something I do encourage, I want to encourage us to take notes today. My sermon topic is the law of impartation. The law of impartation. And if you need a subtopic, you can put the subtopic as how to receive from God. Now, when we talk about part impartation, many people automatically think to the laying on of hands. They automatically think into being launched into your season and your next and having violent encounters at the altar. And there is, that is one aspect to impartation. However, when we deal with the subject of impartation, I think that the body of Christ has limited itself to a component of impartation that is needed and necessary on how to do certain things in the kingdom to be unlocked, to be awakened, to, to move forth in power and authority. And so tonight, I want us to read, we're going to read a scripture. We're going to read Hebrews chapter 10. Um, and we're going to start to read from verse 23 to 25. Is this working behind me? Probably not. Somebody find it, and when you find it, just run your phone up to me. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25. That's going to be our opening scripture tonight. That's Hebrews chapter 10, 23 to 25. NASB. Perfect. And here's how it reads. Uh, 23. It reads like this. Let us hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let's consider how to encourage one another in the Lord and in good deeds. Listen to this. Not abandoning our own meeting together. KJV would say not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As is the habit of some people, but rather encouraging one another. And all the more you see as the day is drawing near. It's very important that we understand when it comes to impartation that there is a kind of impartation that the Father wants to revive to the church. And this kind of impartation is done by the church. Hear me out. We usually are used to the paradigm of impartation coming from, you know, hands being laid on you or impartation coming from, you know, uh, coming to the altar. But there is a kind of impartation that God gives the believers that comes through the church. And I know that we live in a day and age right now where many believers think that I can still love God and not be a part of a church. I don't have to go to church. I have, an own, I have my own relationship with Jesus and God knows my heart. And I go to Bedside Tabernacle where I pray. And I go to Pillow Apostolic Ministries. And the reality is when we look at these things, there are, there's a certain impartation, there's a certain grace that we're missing out on. And it's because there's an, there's an embedded grace that God desires to give us as his church. But it comes through the church. And so I'm going to define impartation. Impartation for the sake of this teaching can be defined as the bestowal of something to someone. The bestowal of something to someone. That word bestowal is to bestow, to give. B-E-S-T-O. B-E-S-T-O-W. The bestowal or that word W-A-L. And that word means the giving or the sharing. So the bestowal of something to someone. 
And if you don't understand how the kingdom works, things are often transferred and shifted. We share in the grace. We share in fellowship. We share in, in joy. This is how God chooses to give the church what the church needs. And so if we, when we dialogue and we talk about impartation, it's important that we know that it's the bestowal, which means the giving or the sharing of something to someone. I want you to write this down. The motivation of gift giving is love. The motivation of gift giving is love. The motivation of gift giving is love. When we talk about impartation, this is how we as a church are to receive from God. Everything that God gives us, he gives it to us as a result of his love. You have to understand this. When Christmas time comes, we buy gifts for our children. What motivates that? Love. When Valentine's Day comes along and you have your boo thing or your husband, you should, should be your husband or your wife, but you have to get there somehow. So you have your boyfriend or your, your fiancé, you, you're motivated to buy them cinnamon hearts because of love. And so we see, we look at John 3, chapter 16. John 3, 16. It's a very well-known scripture verse. It says, for God so loved the world, as a result, he gave. Remember, the motivation of gift giving is love. So for God so loved the world, as a result of his love, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So even the love of God, that he had, the love that God had for the world motivated him to give something. We can also look at Galatians 2 and verse 20. It says that, uh, to paraphrase, the life I now live, I live to the, to the, in the, my body, I live to the faith of the son of God who loved me and what? Gave himself up for me. So, God, in his motivation by love, his response is to give. And it makes sense because the Bible says in 1 John 4 and 8 that God is love. So as a result of his person, as a result of who he is, he by nature can't help but to give. Paul would also go on to say that love is not selfish. It would say love is kind. Let's have 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. Love is not selfish, but it says love is kind. So there's three things you must understand, get ready to write, about embracing or receiving from God. Because believe me, it's not as easy or as simple as we think. Many people think that they're receiving from God, but the reality is they believe in God. Yes, I receive increase. I receive favor. I receive healing. But the results of that don't manifest in our lives. And so I don't want you to trivialize what you're about to hear tonight. All right? Love is patient. Love is kind. That word kind means generous. It's giving. It's, it's giving. It gives. <laughs> Love is giving. All right. Three things you must understand or embrace about receiving God. You guys ready? Number one. God's focal point of blessing is the church. God's focal point of blessing is the church. Now, I must, I must define for you what the church is. The four corners that we see is not the church. The church is the people that you're looking at right now. Well, that's, that's even a stretch. The church is those who believe in Christ as Savior. Let's, let's be accurate, yeah? And so oftentimes when we think of church, we say, yeah, I go to church, but maybe what we mean is I go to a building. So God's focal point of all blessing is the church. Now I'll have my lovely diagram. I'm going to show you how God gives, uh, how heaven distributes things to us. So all blessings, James 1 and 17 says, uh, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, for whom there's no shadow of turning. So when God's giving things to us, it comes from God, and it goes to where? Now, I want you to notice these little colored diagrams. You have a red guy, some black guys, some gray guys, and some light gray guys. Notice that they're all not the same? Because the church represents diversity. Remember, for God so loved the world. It reminds me of the parable of the treasure in the field. It says there was a man that found a treasure in a field. He hid it. 
And that man went away and he went to buy the whole field. This is the same, I believe Jesus was talking about himself. When he saw the treasure or the potential in the world, he said, okay, you know what? I'm going to come back for my treasure and I'm going to come to the entire world. That's why it says, whosoever will believe in me will not perish. You see that? And so God, when he's giving us things, it comes from God, but it goes to the church. Many of us believe that the blessings of God come directly from him. Which is why we say, I don't need church. I have a prayer life of my own. You do. But guess where you learn to pray? At church. So we're not as independent as we think we are. And I think we have to shift our perspective because what the Father is about to do is he's about to give us an appreciation and also a reverence for the church again. The church is glorious. The church is holy. The church is exclusive and the church belongs to Jesus Christ. People of God, please hear me, especially young people. I know I'm young myself, but hear what I'm saying. Church is, ne is, is, is necessary. It is not something, I'm busy this week, oh, I can't. No, 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 no. Shift your life around church. Don't shift, don't shift everything else. Church should be prioritized. So why does Jesus choose the church? Because the church is his bride. The church is his bride. Can I have Acts chapter 20, verse 28? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The church is his bride. I want to show us something in the scripture. And it reads, Be on guard for yourself and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Paul is talking to the elders before he's leaving. And he says, well, uh, let me have, uh, no, that's fine. To shepherd the church of God, which he, what's that P word? With his own. Back in the day, well, maybe not back in the day, depending on the culture that you're a part of. When a man was looking for a woman's hand in marriage, he would have to pay something that's called a dowry. All right? Now, depending on your culture, that may be still happening today, but in Bible times, that was definitely a thing. And so when Paul explains to us that Jesus, or Luke rather, explains to us that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood, what he was doing was he was securing his bride. Are you seeing that? And so as, if he's paying the dowry, that means that there is something that he is waiting to receive his bride. So right now, technically, he's engaged to the church. On, on, on when Christ returns, there's going to be the great heaven, and that's when the great uh, marriage, rather, where Christ will be reunited with his bride, and we will be together with our groom forever. You have to understand these things. And so Jesus paid, number one, the dowry, because he purchased us, but also he also paid our ransom. So the blood of Jesus has two assignments. Number one, to secure his wife, and number two, to cancel his wife's debt. Are you seeing that? So Jesus is showing us how invested he is in us. And so it makes sense because what husband doesn't want to shower his wife in gifts? What husband doesn't want to give the, the, the love of their life everything? What husband doesn't want to give their wife a soft life? Because you know everything that we need, Jesus has provided for us. But until we embrace that we are the church and that God's focal point of blessing is his church. We're putting it into perspective because the church is his bride. Many people wonder, why didn't Jesus get married while he was on earth? I can tell you why. Because he had his eye on somebody else. He had his eye on somebody else and that was us, the church. Number two. We're writing three things that you must understand to embrace or receive from God. Write this down. Everything the believer needs can be found within the church. Everything the believer needs can be found within the church. You must embrace this mindset because we're, we are living exclusively from the church and it's costing us. It's costing us doctrine. It's costing us wisdom. It's, it's costing us a, a holy life. Everything the believer needs can be found within the church. 
There are seven prophetic church references in scripture. How the scriptures represent or how they display or give a, 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 a simile to the church. You have, number one, the church is described as a body of people or rather the ecclesia, the called out ones. Number two, the, the church is also referred to as the human body, which is why we had our opening scripture where Paul was teaching us about the many different parts in the body. Number three, the church is also referenced as the temple of God. Number four, the church is, is referenced through marriage, Ephesians chapter five. Number uh, five, the church is represented in scripture as plant life or trees and vines. Number six, the church is also referenced as the sheepfold. And lastly, number seven, the new Jerusalem. Can I have 1 Corinthians 12? We're going to go back there. I'll start from verse 12. I'm going to read from 12 to 14. I want us to, to take this perspective right now of the church being like the human body. Paul says, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, members means body parts, and all the members of the body, though they are many, they're one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks. What he's doing, he's, he's specifying difference. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. But this is what it says, for the body is not one member, but many. You know what that means? All of us sitting here, some of us are Jamaican, some of us are Nigerian, some of us are Canadian, some of us are whatever you come from. We are many members, but we make up one body. And Paul uses our human body to show us the picture of the church. Because Christ is the head of the church, amen? But the hand function does not do what the leg is commanded to do. If my pelvic muscles decided to give way, I will not be able to stand. And so we all have different functions and we all have different components. But I love what the Bible says. It says that the church edifies itself how? In love. Ephesians chapter 4 and 16, would you? Ephesians chapter 4 and 16. When God, he gave everything that the church needs. And if you want to learn about the church, just study the book of Ephesians. It says, from whom the whole, what's that B word? He's talking about the body of Christ being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. Do you know what that means? My brain is telling my blood to flow to the parts that I need it. My brain has told the mic, my, my brain has told my hand to hold the mic. My brain is, con is, is configuring the English language and it's allowing me to relate to you. Every individual part. And what does it do? It causes the growth of the whole body for the building up of itself in? If we go a few verses higher, give me verse 11. It says, and God gave some to the church. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Where did he give this to? The church. We just read in 1 Corinthians 12, are all apostles? Are all prophets? No. But each have a component that they, that they need to play. Everything you need can be found in church. The church is responsible, listen to this, for the diet of the believer. Mighty God. Listen, the church is responsible for your diet. If you let a kid decide what to eat for dinner, it would be marshmallows and popcorn for the week. But the church is in charge of the diet that the believer needs. This is why you can't be detached from the church. Because you will say, I need to learn about grace. When God wants to teach you about sanctification. I need to learn about how to change my destiny. But God will say, no, you need to learn about repentance. The church decides the diet of the believer. It's in the church that we receive the knowledge of Christ. Um, same chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, give me verse 13. It's at church that you receive knowledge. What does Paul say? Until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Where? To a, to a mature man. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. It's in the church that you get knowledge about Jesus Christ. 
especially when you have a very skilled and mature teaching priest. One who devotes themselves to teaching the word of God to you in an organized manner so that you can understand the ways of the kingdom and grow more in knowledge. This is why we always say church is school. Because you're growing more, you're learning more about the knowledge of the Son of God. Amen? Also, it's in the church that wisdom is dispensed. Ephesians 3, verse 10. 3, verse 10. And God specifically puts these things within the church to keep the believer compelled to stay within the church. And it reads, so that the manifold, what's that W word? Wisdom of God might be made known through where? Are you reading? That the manifold wisdom of God may be known through where? To the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That means that it was always God's intent to let the wisdom, to let his wisdom be shown through the church. We can also look at the gifts of the Spirit. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, you don't have to go there, but I'll just quote it. The word of knowledge. Many of us think the word of knowledge is just you in the back. The Lord shows me you have $7.90 in your bank account, and that's one dimension. But what if I told you that one of the spiritual gifts is the word of knowledge? That means it's the ability to teach the knowledge of Christ in a way that is very unique to the average. You ever listen to some people teach the word? It's as if like you've never heard any teaching on that subject all your life. It's because they were, they were given the gift of knowledge. Solomon was given the spiritual gift of wisdom. We call it the word of wisdom. What we limit that to is I, you just always know what to say. You just always know what to do. And that's one level. But there is a wisdom that comes out of the word of God. And it's meant to be shown through the church. Does that make sense? Let's have 1 Timothy 3 and 15. 1 Timothy 3 and 15. The church is the pillar and the ground of all truth. The church is the pillar and the ground of all truth. This is what Paul says to Timothy. But in the case I'm delayed, so I write to you that you will know how to conduct himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The pillar and support, KJV will say, ground of the truth. You know what this means? It's in the church that you learn truth. Not my truth, not your truth, but God's truth. And unfortunately, we have many teaching priests who have mishandled the word of God. And so they teach philosophies of men. They teach things which are not convenient. They teach uh, get-rich-quick schemes. And they teach, uh, as I always say, three keys to a better life. And they quote one scripture verse, and they never talk about the rest for the whole thing. And it's just PowerPoint presentations and slides, which we should have to help support. But we need to come back to the place where the believer comes to school, sorry, church, every week. Because it's through knowledge that you learn. Even your human body shows us that over time, if you feed yourself the right nutrients and you eat your greens and you drink your, your all that other stuff to keep your liver and all that, it will help build your immune system. It helps you grow. But why do we give babies formula? So that they can grow. What are you feeding your spiritual life? And this goes beyond listening to sermons on YouTube from a church across the nation. Are you being intentional about receiving food? Peter said that we as pastors should feed the flock of God. That's my responsibility, to feed you. But guess what? We can only lead the donkey. I'm not calling you donkeys. We can only lead the donkey to the water. But we cannot force it to drink. When my mom says, or when my wife says, hey, dinner's ready. If I don't come to the table and eat, I will not be fed. We have to establish the church as the pillar of all ground. This is another one for you. Let's have James chapter 5 and 14. We're almost done. Healing from sickness and disease is dispensed from the elders of the church. Listen, remember, everything you need can be found in church. Is there any sick among you? If there is, let him call for the elders. Let me pause right here. James didn't say that the elders should hunt you down and call you to pray for you. James says, if there's any sick among you, let the sick person call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Everything you need is here in the church. Knowledge, wisdom, 
the graces of Christ, joy, peace. As the word is being dispelled, God has a way of giving each and every one of us what we need. Because what I came to church for may not be what you came to church for. But in the fellowship of the church, God has a way to supply all of our needs. Amen? So how does God impart blessings to you? This is number three, our last one, okay? Number three, this is things that you need to understand and embrace about how to receive from God. Number three, write this down. In order for you to receive from God, you must be within the context of his covenant. In order for you to receive from God, you must be within the context of his covenant. It's long, so I'll say it again. In order for you to receive from God, you must be within the context of his covenant. Now remember I said that one of the seven prophetic pictures of the church are plant life. So let's look at John chapter 15, verse 1. We're going to look at the church from the standpoint of being the vine. This is the writing of Jesus. We're going to go to verse 7. It says, I, this is Jesus speaking, am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. For every branch, that's us, in me, that does not bear fruit, the vine dresser takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because the word which I have spoken to you. So hold on a minute. Jesus is saying that you are purged and you're set to create more fruit because of the word which you've received. Where do you receive the word? At church. Verse 4. Abide in me. My God, this is good. And I in you. Why? As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself or as the believer cannot bear fruit not connected to a church. It cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides or unless it's connected to the vine so neither can you unless you abide in me verse 5 i am the vine you are the branches he who abides or he who's connected in me and connected to me and i'm connected to him he bears much fruit why for apart from me you can do nothing verse 6 if anyone does not abide in me he is thrown away as the branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Last verse. If you abide in me, and not just you abiding, but if my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Jesus has a covenant with his church. We are his bride. He has a covenant with his church. And in order to reap the benefits of the vine, you have to be connected to the vine. God forbid, if I rip my arm out of its socket and throw it on the ground, I don't mean to be graphic for people who don't like blood. Imagine just blood spewing everywhere. Okay, 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 okay. okay. <laughs> An amputated body part is no good to the body as long as it's disconnected. And so Jesus says that if your branch is not connected to the vine, you can't bear fruit. So why do we believe that we don't need a church in order to bear fruit? Why do we believe, well, apostle, you just don't know they hurt me at that church. And they, did you go for friends or did you go to grow? Church people are just so fake, I can't stop. Did you, go, did you come for friends or did you come for a relationship with Christ? We have to assess our mode. Why do you go to church? A dismembered body part is no good to the body as long as it's disconnected. Repeat after me. No loose limbs. No loose limbs. You have to be connected. And you just can't connect to a church by membership. A certificate doesn't make you connected. You want to know what makes you connected? Your heart posture towards the vine. Your heart's posture towards God. The church is the assembly or it's heaven's authorized distribution center to give you what you need. The church is blue check marked on Instagram. So God, in order for God to do anything, God says, okay, I'm going to look for a church who's hungry. 
I'm going to look for a church whose motives are in the right place. I'm going to look for a church who is all about sound doctrine and all about line upon line precept. And that's why when God gives revival, he usually does it through a church. We have too many loose limbs wanting to spark revival. We have too many loose limbs wanting to be the next change in the earth. God moves through his church. And if you want to be a part of that move, you've got to be connected at the heart level. Apostle Joshua Selman says something. He always says the blessings of God come, come, I always mess this up. The blessings of God come to man through man. But I'm going to give us something and it says the blessings of God come to the church through the church. For you, all blessings of God, they come to the church and then you receive it through the church. You have to shift your thinking. I don't know where this new understanding of Lone Ranger Christian came from. The church is not a physical institution or an edifice. It's a body. A body of believers. That's why he says where two or three are gathered, I will be in their midst. One person is not a gathering. Oh, the word is good. Where two or three your devotion is great, but your devotion is just devotion. It's when you come to the body of believers, and when I'm worshiping on your left, and your sister's worshiping on your right, we have now made the church. The church is not a person. The church is a people. 1 Peter 2 and 9. The church is not a person. The church is a people. Apostle Peter is teaching us and giving us identity for who we are. He says, but you, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. KJV would say a peculiar people. That's who we are to God, a holy nation. We have to embrace these things when it comes to the church. So, how can we connect to the church? Number one, you can connect in three ways. You connect to the church by prioritizing church attendance. I'm giving you practical things you can do. You connect to the church by prioritizing church attendance. We just read through the unknown writer who we believe is Paul that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. He says, as this is the current habit, it is the habit of hell to make sure that you get discouraged and that your eyes get off of the whole mandate of church. Don't forsake the assembly. Don't allow one person's issues. In fact, if you have issues with anyone in the church, Jesus says you should go to your brother, tell him his fault, and if he listens, you gain him. So if we're going to let people stop us from going to church... You prioritize church by plugging in at the heart level, by doing what you're doing now, listening to sermons, taking notes, allowing the word of God to wash over you like Jesus does his, does his bride. The, the washing over of the water of the word. Number two, how can you connect to the church? This is my favorite one. Oh, this is my favorite one. Okay. By trusting the body to give you the nourishment you need to grow. By trusting the body, which is the church, to give you the nourishment you need to grow into the stature of Christ. The enemy has worked hard at breaking people's trust when it comes to church. That's why I said it and I, I felt everyone get triggered. Well, they're just not feeding me over there. Maybe you're just not eating over there. What if... The diet they're giving you, you don't want. Because you feel in your own sanctimonious, prideful self that you should be doing other things. You connect to the church by trusting the church. And what does that mean? You trust his officers. You trust his elders. You trust his leaders who take the time to hear God for you. And when they speak the word of God, it's your job to listen Put it into practice and let the nourishment do what it needs to do. Praise God. And lastly, you can connect to the church by maintaining your covenant of love towards Christ and his commands. 
by maintaining your covenant of love towards Christ and his commands. He gives the picture in marriage in Ephesians 5 all about submission to Christ. He says, Wives, love your own husbands and be submitted to them as to the Lord. So it is the expectation that we as the church are submissive or submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so because of our love for him, we need to heed his commands. What do you say in John 14? I think it's verse 16, I think. If you love me, keep my commandments. Because love is proven. It's proven by the A, the gifts that you give or the gifts that are received, but it's also proved by obedience. I can't show somebody, the best way to show somebody that I love them is to be obedient. These are the three things we must learn to embrace if we're going to learn how to receive from God. God doesn't jump over his church to give you a blessing individually. He gives the blessing to the church. And then the church, by way of your partnership, by way of your connection at the heart, is how it then flows to you. Amen? Amen. Thank you. So let's recap. Number one, the focal point of God's blessing is the church. Number two, everything that we need can be found within the church. I pray, I pray you believe this. Number three, the blessing for the believer is from its connection to the church. And we can connect to the church by prioritizing attendance, trusting God to provide everything we need, and by maintaining our covenant of love towards him. The church is glorious. The church is beautiful. Let me share this last thing before we rapidly move to the next segment. I remember when I was... Uh, working with uh, Apostle Ryan to plant this ministry. And I, for the longest time, anybody who knows me intimately knows that this was not what I wanted to do with myself. And I remember wrestling, I said, okay, if we're gonna do something, we gotta be different. Like, I don't wanna be like, you know, classified as like a church. And I remember one day the Lord said, what's wrong with my church? And I was like, I didn't mean it like that. Like, what I was trying, I, re- I had to really sit down and be like, what, what is the stigma with church that I didn't want to be associated with anything called church? And I realized it that what I meant to say, and I say this humbly, please understand my heart of love, I say this humbly. I was so tired of going to church and seeing sick people come in and sick people go out. But I just didn't have language. So I said, if that's what church is, I don't want any part of it. But then the Lord began to challenge me and says, if you walk according to my precepts, you preach what I tell you to preach and not what you think is good, I will give you miracles and notable signs. And so I then said, you know what? Maybe it is possible to do business with God and to have the church that Jesus designed for us to have. And I think that's where many of us fall short. We, we've come into the pressure of this westernized, modernized way of doing church. And the reality is, topics like the blood of Jesus, binding and loosing, deliverance, we think are too much for the people. We think it's too old school. But let me bless you with this. If it was good enough for Paul and Silas, it's good enough for me. If it was good enough for the apostles, it's good enough for me. And I'm afraid that we have a generation who don't understand the, the foundations of the kingdom. Right. And we use the church as a casting agency to cast our talent. And when the church doesn't recognize your little singing gift, you get mad and go to the place that will. What is it about? They didn't recognize me as an apostle, so I'm leaving. Is that what you need? Is this why you come to church? I have all these gifts in me and no one's noticing it. If you want to be seen, go to a Canadian Idol. We have, we have to shift our perspective of church. This is not like, the platform is not the aim. Paul says, for those of you who are teachers, don't be quick to want to be teachers because you'll receive the greater condemnation. Everybody wants to preach, but do you want to be held accountable on judgment? You can't have one without the other. You want to prophesy until you prophesy somebody into something that they shouldn't be in and they come knocking on your door and say, I thought you said. 
This is a holy calling. The church is a holy place. This is not for us to get our ego and our self-esteem coddled. I frequently tell God, God, if you're not going to give me no anointing, use somebody else. I have no problem funding, putting my resources, clapping somebody else. We need to shift our perspective when it comes to church. So yes, I understand you're tired and you have a long day. But if you were tired and having a long day, you would still wake up and go to church and go to, sorry, work the next day. Why do we prioritize work more than church? But let me balance it. What if the church isn't doing what the church needs to do to provide enough value for you to come out and receive? So I'm not saying it's all on the the, the, the believer. Sometimes it's we, the, the teaching priests, that drop the ball. But in the events where you have a place that God has given, a man of God, a woman of God, that can relate the kingdom, that will teach you things that you may think are boring, but in the long run will benefit you. There are some things I remember studying. I'm at home studying and I'm nodding. Oh boy, still on, still on verse 15 for the last 30 minutes. And I would read it and read it and read it. Why? Because I'm like, there's something in this that I may not understand now. But I know that it's good for me. And let me bless you with this. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, instruction, for correcting. All scripture. We need to get back to the Bible. Preach the word. That's what Paul told Timothy. Be instant. You know what that means? Always be ready. Whether they care about it or not. Whether they're interested or not. Whether they show up or don't. Preach the word. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But they will heap to themselves teachers having what? Itchy ears. Wanting to hear fables and stories. Did you come to church to hear stories? Or did you come to church to get transformed? The pastor is so charismatic and he just has a, is a you become the church for charisma? If you want to be entertained, go watch a, a TED talk. Church was so boring today. So was your biology class, but you have to pay attention to pass. Will you pass your test when these things come at you? Church is a place to learn. Amen. And listen, I want us to embrace, I'm done. I want us to embrace what it means to be the church. This is part one. Next week, I'm going to teach us how to receive from God. But instead, I'm going to teach you how God gives the church what we need and how we as believers should respond as a result of our connection to the church. So I'm doing it in two segments. I'm showing you tonight how God gives to the church, but next week I'll teach how the church gives to the believer and the role that the believer plays in that. Amen? I mean, let's stand. Let's all rise. We're going to be very quick tonight. We're going to pray three prayer points. We're going to do them just for a minute. And I want for us to begin to fashion our minds and get ready to pray, okay? The first prayer point that we're gonna make is we're gonna renounce any improper mindsets towards the church. Any improper mindsets that you have towards the church as a result of this teaching tonight. Are you ready? Come on, let's lift our hands and pray. Father, we, pray, we thank you. And we renounce right now every faulty belief system we renounce right now every improper belief system that we've had towards the church. Oh God, we repent of not prioritizing the kingdom, of not prioritizing church, of not prioritizing your bride and our connection to it. Come on, somebody pray. Just pray. Pray. This is your chance to trust what God has put in me for this moment. Come on, pray. Renounce them. Any improper mindsets. Any people that hurt you. Any bad experiences. Begin to renounce them. Begin to denounce them. The church is beautiful. Come on, make those, make those confessions. The church is amazing. The church is the bride of Christ. Yeah. All right. I want you to lay any
any church hurt that you may have, I want you to surrender it to the Lord. Come on, do that. Do that. Do that. Do that. Father, all church hurt, all pain, all negative experiences, I begin to lay them down. Oh God, I cry out right now that you would heal our heart, that you would heal us, Lord God, from anything that would distract us from the beauty and the glory of the church of the living God. Oh God, I pray that your people will no longer put people, situations, circumstances before their love and their commitment to the church. Come on, somebody lay down that church hurt. Lay down that negative experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. I pray, God, that you would give us a shift. Somebody lift your hands to receive. Lift it. You're about to receive impartation. Impartation that God is going to give to us, the church. Lift. And when you have your hands lifted, receive it by faith. Father, I ask, in the name of your Son, the head of the church, our Lord, our King, won't you release a fresh love for the bride of Christ? Come on, receive that. Receive that. Love is beginning to fill your heart. Affection is beginning to fill your heart. Come on, receive that impartation of love. We prioritize your church. We prioritize, we trust you, your ability to give us what we need through the church. We receive knowledge through the church. We receive wisdom through the church. We receive our death from the church. Here's what I want us to do. We're going to pray again. And this time as we pray, we're going to pray with the perspective as the bride of Christ. Please project John 15 and 17. Sorry, 7, verse 7. John 15, verse 7. We're going to pray with this perspective in mind. The Lord just dropped this in my spirit. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. We're about to ask, knowing that we abide in him. Amen? I want you at this point to make your prayer request known unto God. And I want you to pray passionately. I want you to pray violently. I want you to pray in faith, believing that whatsoever you need, God will supply. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh God, we pray that you supply all of our needs. Come on, somebody needs to pray. Pray with passion. Pray with fervency. Pray with conviction. You are a part of the church. He will hear you. Your word says that if we ask anything in your name, you will do it for those who love you. Father, we make our request known. We confess that we are in you. And you are in us. Come on, somebody pray. If you need healing, pray. If you need bread, you pray. If you need favor, pray. If you need favor, pray. If you need favor, pray. 